And I start the talk with the sentence that mentioned uh, yesterday, Philippe uh, Dejeu, and uh, I modified it slightly, and saying that everything should start in the field, everything should end in the field, and that's a sentence of Jean-Antoine Rioux, who just passed away last year, in fact. And I think it's it. if you work with neglected disease, you should always try to think of that. Okay. Um, when you think of leishmaniasis, you have the different leishmaniasis, different leishmania species, and you have different pathologies. And it goes from, for example, here, cutaneous leishmaniasis with uh, infection with different uh, species like major, brasiliensis, guayanensis, etiopica, or visceral leishmaniasis where you have infection with donovani or infantum. In the middle, you have this uh, bizarre you can call it a different type of leishmaniasis, which are mucosal leishmaniasis, or mucocutaneous leishmaniasis, or disseminated leishmaniasis. And uh, we, these are caused by parasites like Brasiliensis, uh, Guayanensis, or Ethiopica. And you can find the same kind of parasite which can give rise to cutaneous leishmaniasis, or mucosal or disseminated leishmaniasis. And we started to use this, the term of metastatic leishmaniasis, saying that you have first the first lesion due, due, to, due to this parasite, and then you have dissemination of the infection, like a metastasis, in fact, like in cancer field. This uh, type of leishmaniasis, they are linked to, it's like an inflammatory disease. They are production of high amount of inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, and uh, they are difficult to treat. There is a lot of relapses in this kind of uh, leishmaniasis. Some years ago, we found out that these parasites, like Brasiliensis, Guayanensis, and Ethiopica, they can carry a virus. Okay? They carry, inside the parasite, they carry a virus which is called Leishmania RNA virus. And we have isogenic lines here, which are L LRV+, plus for Leishmania RNA virus plus, or Leishmania RNA virus negative. And we can follow the presence, or detect the presence of this virus in these different Leishmania species. We have antibodies against this double-stranded RNA. You can, have, you can buy it, you can find it, you can see the strain that you have a virus, or you have a double-stranded RNA molecule in this parasite. Um, so what, what are these viruses? These viruses, this is a virus that you can find also in yeast. This is a structure of a yeast virus. They are a member of the Totiviridae family. They have a capsid. The capsid is around 100 subunits in the capsid. You have a one double-stranded RNA molecule, which encodes a capsid and an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which is present inside the viral particle or virus-like particle. They are present in the cytoplasm, in the cytosolic of the parasites. They are normally not shedded, so it means not produced. They stay inside. There are some exceptions, like in Javia. Javia, where you can have the virus which is, ex which is, uh, uh, which is uh, expelled, uh, if I can say this word. And so they are more like an endosymbiont, or the, like a persistent infection inside the, the parasite. You can find in Leishmania, uh, at the beginning it was described only in Brasiliensis and in Guayanensis. We describe it in Leishmania etiopica. And now there are some strains in Leishmania major. You can some isolate, you can find it in Leishmania major. You can find it in Leishmania infantum, some isolates, and also in Leishmania showy and Leishmania panamensis. So more and more you can start to see in some isolates the presence of this double stranded RNA virus. And they have been classified as Leishmania RNA virus type 1 when they come from the new world, and Leishmania RNA type 2 when they are from the old world. The presence of these viruses, you sh I showed you the structure of the yeast, RNA virus, but they are present in all the protein, all, all the uh, protozoan parasites. You can find it, as I said, in Jardia, in, Le in Leishmania, in Trichomonas, in Entamoeba, Emeria, and so on. So they are present in a lot of different uh, pathogenic uh, protozoan parasites. But there are even more. I think now there are description of these viruses in Trypanosoma cruzi, in Toxoplasma gondi, in Plasma, Plasmodium yoeli, and at least through EM pictures, it's probably present also in Plasmodium vivax. 
So more and more people start to look for it and start to find it in different uh, parasites. For in two cases, it was described that these viruses has an effect on virulence, which is in Leishmania, in Guayanensis and Brazilianensis, and in Trichomonas. And they are probably, if Steve Beverly moves a bit ahead, he can publish the Toxo, the Toxo paper. The Toxo paper is done, but it's, it's you know it's sitting on Steve's desk. Um, so how does it work? So if you look. Uh, when the parasite goes in, it stays. It goes into the phagolysosome-like or phagolysosome-like uh, organelle. In this organelle, here there is some parasites which are killed. The double-stranded RNA is released, acts on a specific TOLAC receptor, which is TOLAC receptor three. Acting on TOLAC receptor three, you have production of type one interferon. This is known. Luckily, TOLAC receptor three is only activated by double-stranded RNA. And then if you have type 1 interferon, then you can start to have uh, inflammatory chemokines and cytokines. Then you also attract cells like neutrophil, macrophage, T cell, DC, uh, DC T cells, MK, and so on. Then if you look, if we go a bit more into the detail, uh, what we observed is, as I said, you have activation of the TLR3 with, a with an associated molecule which, which is TRIF. And then you have exacerbation of the infection, so you increase the parasite load, you increase the inflammation. Everything is related, relates to the production of type 1 interferon, alpha and beta. And then you have chemokine and cytokine, which are upregulated, which are produced, and they do the job. Um, on the other hand, when the fact that you activate uh, TOLAC receptor 3, you increase the survival of macrophage. And we show that we have an induction of near 115, which is a mark of inflammation, in fact. But also with that, we have phosphorylation of AKT1, and AKT1 is like an oncochip. Um, coming back to the discussion that Paul raised, I mean the points that Paul raised yesterday about biologics and we should block uh, some uh, host cells, we tried to block uh, AKT with specific drug. The problem was that uh, AKT phosphorylation only occurs during a certain period of time. So if we want to target specific kinase, I think we have to go for kinase which are still activated for or still active for a certain period of time. I'm not, I mean, they stay, uh, they stay active. If you go for some specific kinase, which, which are activated during the first hours, then they disappear. And the activation is gone, so we sh should really think of which kind of kinase we should, we should target. We did that and did not work with AKT. It can work with all the kinase. Okay. Anyway, so what we showed also is that uh, there are different papers, either for Leishmania brasiliensis or Leishmania guayanensis. When the virus is present, you can see that the patients, in fact, were difficult. There is a lot of relapses of this patient, and they were difficult to treat. The, today, I will briefly discuss about the metastasis uh, phenotype that we observed. So the work was done, uh, the hypothesis that we had at the beginning is that we have activation of TOLAC receptor 3, I didn't show you, but we have production of interleukin 6 and interleukin 23, and this can dr drive <coughs> the differentiation of TH17. TH17, they produce, where is it, here, they produce interleukin 17A and F, 17A being the most uh, frequent and more active, they act on non-immune cells, so and on adaptive cells like T cells, B cells, endothelial cells, macrophage. They induce pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, matrix, ma matrix metalloprotease, which could degrade soft tissues, in fact, and also growth factors. And then it goes and goes on. And you have more and more interleukin 17A, and then uh, you have an hyperinflammation. And this is absolutely similar to what you can see in other inflammatory diseases, like uh, RA, like uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and uh, chronic inflammatory disease. You have a lot, for example, in RA, you have interleukin 17A, which is produced. So, based on that, uh, we uh, on this hypothesis, we analyzed patients in collaboration with the Pasteur Institute in French Guiana, 
And what you can see here is the production of interleukin 17A measured by QRT-PCR either in the acute phase of patients when the virus is present here, D plus, LRV plus versus LRV minus, or in chronic patients where you start to see a lot of interleukin 17A which is produced. That was done by QRT-PCR, uh, but we have some data on the, on the protein lab. And uh, what was striking, in fact, is uh, in the, uh, we analyzed then the acute lesions, and we use acute lesion to be sure that in chronic infection, in chronic disease, you don't have another type of infection which is coming up in the next months. So we analyze in the acute lesions, the acute lesions, so that's what I showed you before. You have interleukin 17A, which is produced when the virus is present inside the parasite. And, but we increasingly, we have a decrease in interferon gamma. So we have some kind of proxy showing that if you have a lot of interleukin 17A and a low level of interferon gamma, patients are at risk to develop possibly metastatic uh, leishmaniasis. So we decided that based on that, maybe can we really prove it, that it's really the case, so we went into the mice. Uh, we did mice studies. And the first thing that we did, or we did different things, but among them, we have production of interleukin 17A in the popliteal lymph nodes, so when the virus is present here in wild type mice, and uh, V plus, a lot of interleukin 17A, V minus, uh, low level of interleukin 17A. It depends on toll like receptor 3, as I told you. The virus activates toll like receptor 3, so if you take a mouse which is not out for toll like receptor 3, you don't have production of interleukin 17A. So, based on that, we analyze saying, okay, if you think of humans, you need interleukin 17A, but low level of interferon gamma. So, we started to infect mice which were interferon gamma knockout. So, if you take wild type mice, we infect the food pan, and we have parasites which are luciferase plus, LAC plus. And so, if you infect wild type mice, normally uh, the parasite stays inside the, uh, in the food pan. If you go in interferon gamma knockout mice, then you can have migration from the footpad into the tail. So you can see parasite leave, or you have less parasite, I cannot say really leave, at least you have less parasite in the footpad, and you start to see parasite in the tail. So we have some kind of model of dissemination. And in this model of dissemination, you can measure the number of metastatic uh, or metastasis in the tail according to the week post infection. So you can see V plus. And in versus V minus, what you, what you observe is when the virus is present, you have an exacerbation of the disease. You still have dissemination with V minus, okay? It's not black and white. It's, you have really more uh, lesion formation when you have the virus which is present, and the de you have a delay and less, and less metastasis or less lesion in the tail when the virus is not present inside the parasite. So to prove it that we have a relation between interleukin 17 and interferon gamma, we generated double knockout. So this is interferon gamma knockout mice, metastatic score, V plus, V minus. So clear, more metastasis or more lesions in the tail when the parasite is present, when the virus is present, but if you do a double knockout, so if you remove interleukin 17A, then the score is going down or disappear. So showing that you have a relation with I interleukin 17A, low or no interferon gamma in our model. And uh, then to go back in the field, what can we do to block it? Uh, you can block interleukin 17A by working on the, in, on the transcription factor, low gamma T. Uh, and then you can see that, for example, digoxin blocks interleukin 17. Uh, transcription factor, and there are small molecules which are, in tr which are developed, which are in phase two, and these kind of molecules are typically used against people are trying to use it again, all the chronic disease. Okay, so here we can take advantage of what's going on. Either digoxin, you could use it, even if it's not the best drug, but you could use digoxin to block the metastasis process or to decrease the interleukin 17A. You will not resolve the lesion, but at least you will uh, decrease uh, the metastasis and by blocking uh, interleukin 17 either with decoxin or a small molecule like SR1001. 
So in conclusion, what I can say is that we have a model of dissemination. It depends on interleukin-17. Uh, we work in a model where we have low level or no interferon gamma. So we work, I mean, probably to have dissemination, you need low interferon gamma. And that's what we observed. It's like in humans, what the first data that we obtained were in humans. Then we confirmed in the mouse studies. And that's the severity. Severity is mediated by the presence of LRV plus in guayanensis, like in humans. Based on that, um, we can now try to understand how the dissemination occurs. And uh, so we decided to characterize the dissemination process, and this is work in progress. Uh, how does the parasite go from the foot pad into the tail or in different organs? So we use our interferon gamma knockout mouse, and we infect it either with V plus or V minus. And this work was done by VJ uh, in collaboration with a group of um, Tatiana Petrova in Lausanne. So we took mice. She took mice. I should say not we. She should she took mice, kill them with one, two, four, six, and eight plus infection, and collected different organs either lymph, different lymph nodes, the spleen, the blood, tested the blood, foot pad, tail, and so on. So the mouse was chopped in pieces. And uh, she quantified the number of cells in the lymph nodes, also checked in the organs, spleen, liver, and so on, and also the presence of the parasites in the different organs. She did a limited dilution assay, so took the lymph node, put in culture, and see how many parasites were coming out of the lymph node. Simple assay. Simple, but a lot of work, okay? And uh, VJ is wild. I have to say she will do everything to get, uh, if she needs to kill 10 mice, she will kill, kill 10 mice. If it's 100 mice, she will kill 100 mice. Nothing stops VJ. Uh, not even me. And so this is just an example of, uh, I just put some of that, but she did all the lymph node, everything. This is just, I don't want to give you, I mean, to overload you with all these kind of graphs, just to give you the example. Here you have weeks post infection, here you have the number of cells, and you have infection with V plus in red, V minus in blue. So you can see that you have an increase very quickly in the popliteal lymph node. You can see a V plus, so increase, but also V minus, but first uh, we have more. Uh, cells in when you have a V plus infection. The same for inguinal lymph nodes, so you have a delay always with V minus, you have a delay. So you, again, you have this exacerbation of the disease with V plus. Same for iliac lymph node, axillary lymph node, and so on. She did limited dilution for all the organs you can imagine. Okay. Everything. And she did two or three times. So <laughs> Here you have the different lymph nodes. For example, week one, week two, week three, four, one, two, four, six, and eight. The left and right, left and right, in when, when she infected only in the left foot pad. So you can see here, parasite load. I mean, the number of parasites after dilution and growth in culture. So you can see week two, then you have increase in week four in the popliteal. Then you can start to see in the iliac, in the inguinal, in the iliac, and so on. And she did also for, she did it for the foot pad, for the tail, for the end. So if you have a migration, you inject in the rear foot pad to see if you have it in four hands. And uh, so based on that, she can generate a model, which is now still under progress. So what we have. If we inject in the foot pad, we have first popliteal, and the, so you can see the dissemination of the infection through the different lymph nodes. And you, the, in this case, it was injected in the, sorry, if I come back, was injected in the left foot pad. I should go back. Left foot pad, then you have all the left side. I mean, she considered left, uh, okay, she inverted, but. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, so you have first the left side, and once the left side is really infected, then you start to see it on the right side. Probably we have different uh, migration systems. We have one which goes from the foot pad or the popliteal, we don't know, to the tail. 
and then probably we go uh, also from on to specific uh, lymph node like a sciatic lymph node. We are probably finding a new way of dissemination, but that's according to people in the lymph node field and dissemination field. So um, I can kind of judge yet. So what we have anyway is that we have an increase in the inflammation, or we have an hyperinflammation and the increase in the number of cells and systemic progression of the infection through at least we can see it in the lymph nodes. So we are using different uh, blocking antibodies to block neutrophils, inflammatory monocytes and uh, resident macrophage. We don't, still don't know exactly what else, which is the cargo cells or if we have one cell or several cells. This we don't know. But we, the model we are working on is probably we have neutrophil, inflammatory monocytes, and resident macrophage. So in this case, I can exactly tell you how it goes. Maybe one cell, maybe several cells. That's still under, uh, she, she's still working on that. Can we get the same kind of phenotype with other viruses? Okay. So can we, if we go for co-infection. So you can, then in this case, you take a parasite and you infect with another virus. So it means this parasite does not carry the LRB, but you infect with all the viruses. The first one we did is Toscana virus. Toscana virus is a single-stranded RNA virus. It's a flebovirus. It circulates in the, sa in the same vector, in the same fly. So you can have co-circulation of Leishmania goyenensis, for example, and Toscana virus, or Leishmania de, Leishmania de Novan or Infantum with Toscana virus. Anyway, so these viruses, they, they can be present. Toscana, it's called Toscana, but we have the same kind of viruses in different sand flies all over the world. So if you, we can forget about that. Let's focus on this part. So if you infect mice in the foot pan, so normally you have this side of lesion when you have an infection with Leishmania goyanensis, which does not carry LRV, but if you now infect in the same site with a Toscana virus, then you have an increase in the footpath size. So you have, anyway, if you have co-infection with another virus, you can exacerbate the infection. And uh, so it's not easy to work with Toscana, so we decided to go in easier models. So we started to infect with LCMV, so lymphocytic chronomelangitis virus, so LCMV. LCMV is a minor strand, single-strand RNA. It induces a strong type 1 interferon. So here you can see this is the same kind of model. We co-infected now here with Leishmania goyanensis, give rise to some lesion in the foot pad, and co-infected with LCMV. In this case, LCMV was injected IP, whereas uh, Leishmania goyanensis was in injected in the foot pad. And you can see that if you have LCMV, you have a really exacerbation. You produce a lot of type 1 interferon. So you have an increase in the size of the lesion. And everything is depending on type 1, because if you use mice which do not have a receptor for type 1, which are called FNAR mice, so this one, they don't have the receptor, they will not have a response to type 1 interferon. So if you use this kind of mice, you can see that now you don't have this kind of uh, exacerbation of the lesion. And uh, I go quickly through different experiments, but just want to show you that in the same time, we have dissemination in the tail. So this is what I showed you. You can see bumps here when we have the virus, Leishmania RNA virus in Guayanensis. You can see bumps in the tail. When the virus is not present, you don't see it or you, it's a, there is a delay. But when you do a co-infection with LCMV and Leishmania Guayanensis LRV minus, so without, a, without LRV, but with LCMV, then you start to see bumps. And you can see, and you can measure here the, as a metastatic score that we have per mouse, a uh, series of mouse, you can see LRV plus or LRV minus plus LCMV. And then you start to have also this dissemination. So you can have dissemination either when the virus is present, when the virus is present inside the parasite, or when you do a co-infection. So, um, and everything probably, what we think, is when you have type 1 interferon, you have a decrease in the, here in this case, of interferon gamma receptor. So cells will, res will respond less to interferon gamma this time. So uh, it's what you can see here. We measure 
we measure the interferon gamma receptor at the surface of the macrophage. So when you infect with V plus, you have this amount. When you have V minus, you have more interferon gamma receptor at the cell surface. When you go and no co-infect with LCMV, you have a decrease in the interferon gamma receptor. So, yeah. so clearly, when you have type 1, like interferon type 1, you decrease the amount of, of interferon gamma at the cell surface. This is, you, we prove it, prove it at least, we continue to demonstrate it, that we have, uh, it, it depends on type 1, because if you use f now mice, then you don't see this decrease in the type 1 uh, in the interferon gamma receptor. And if you do the same, so in fact, if you inject interferon or in, uh, incubate with, uh, sorry, incubate with uh, type 1, either alpha or beta, this is with PBS, if you put type 1, alpha or beta, you have a decrease of uh, interferon gamma receptor. So we think that what happens is you have less interferon gamma receptor at the cell surface when you have a type 1 production, and then probably the cell responds less to, uh, to interferon gamma. Interestingly, here this is what I showed you. Uh, here you have V minus infection, so the lesion size is defined here, and when you have V, v plus parasite, you have an increase in size of the lesion. What we did is was to inject LCMV once a, when the mice started to heal, okay? And when you do that, you here you have the LCMV injection. What we observe is that we have in we have an increase again of the size of the lesion, either with V plus, this is not very big, but when we have V minus, then the lesion started to be very big. And uh, so <coughs> that sho this shows that probably, at least with Leishmania guayanensis, we have a relation between the size of the lesion, parasite load, I don't show you the parasite load, size of the lesion, exacerbation of the lesion, plus parasite load, which depends on the presence of type 1 interferon. So, and if you remove uh, the receptor for type 1, here it is, either this one or this one with V plus or V minus, then you don't see this kind of uh, phenotype. So we summarize this kind of hypothesis in uh, a small review that she just published. Uh, so if you have an infection with V minus, you have a certain, a certain size in, in the foot pad dish in, the, in a wild type mice. If you go in a gamma knockout solution, I mean the infection stays mainly in the foot pad. But if you inject now LCMV, then they relapse and they start to produce uh, again big lesions and a lot of parasite in the, the lesion. If you have V plus, then you have interferon 1, type 1, which is produced, and then not only in the interferon gamma knockout mice, then the parasite moves from the footpath in the tail and in the other lymph nodes. But if you come with LCMV, then the lesion size is, is small. So it means that if, they, if you, depending when, you are, when the mouse is, is exposed to type 1 interferon, you will either develop metastasis or relapse in the, in the, in the case of... Uh, in this case here, where they were, ex were not exposed to type 1, but then if you come with type 1 or LCME, then the lesion starts again. <coughs> if you use now V minus parasite, co-infection with LCMV, you have a big lesion, but then you have metastasis, but if you come back, you don't have it. Anyway, so what we can say, uh, okay, okay, maybe I have time. This is for LCMV, all the viruses, okay? Uh, this is uh, so. Now I come in a single case. Okay, I think we should uh, always think of what's going on in some cases, and that probably gives you uh, some ideas. This is a Swiss woman who lived in Paraguay, stayed one month in Bolivia, and came to the clinic uh, in Bolivia first with small skin lesions. And uh, this dish, and uh, when she came back to Switzerland, in the same time they found out that she was uh, HIV positive. And they started the treatment. This is the number of CD4, the number of RNA copies, and then she was proposed an antiretroviral therapy. But even if she was able to control uh, HIV infection, 
uh, the lesions continued to progress slowly, and she started to have him on the limbs, arms, and trunks, and very big lesions. And I can show you this is the, the type of lesions she had. And it was going on and going on. Then they started to complain of uh, a dry rhinitis, and uh, they started to observe that in the nasal septum that she started to have inflammation of the nasal septum, which is typically a uh, pathology that you can observe in uh, mucocutaneous uh, leishmaniasis. They didn't see at this time any kind of uh, cartilaginous, uh, cartilaginous uh, degradation or pharyngeal involvement, but um, you can see that they had, she had a strong uh, non-specific inflammation in the, in the nasal mucosa. They decided to type, I mean to see, to look, started to look for leishmania, and they found out that it's in Bern. This was done in Bern. She was diagnosed with leishmaniasis and leishmania brasiliensis. Uh, due to the cis bizarre uh, pathology, was not like what they observed normally with Brazilianzis or HIV and Brazilianzis. Uh, we they were they asked us to detect to see if there was a virus, and then between two different isolate we can find that uh, there is not only Brazilianzis, but we had Brazilianzis plus LRV. So in fact, this person was infected with Brazilianzis carrying LRV plus HIV. <coughs> and uh, then they started the treatment with liposomal amphotericin B, and amphotericin B works pretty well, and I, I showed you yesterday, in fact, that amphotericin B works pretty well against parasite carrying the virus. Okay, it's a pretty good treatment. And this confirmed that, in fact, on the field, that the skin ulcer began to heal two weeks after the treatment initiation, and now she is uh, pretty fine, at least with her leishmaniasis. And this is the woman, you can see it here. This is before the treatment, okay, and after the treatment, of one or two weeks after the treatment, where she started to heal, and now it's more or less uh, disappeared. So, I'm getting close to the end. Um, the message of this talk is that we are entering really in a terra incognita. There are a lot of viruses, flaboviruses in centri. <coughs> Yesterday we saw that uh, there was a microbiome of the centri with bacteria. Um, I showed you flaboviruses with Toscana, but the others, Massilia virus, CCD virus, and so on. Uh, there are new viruses in trypanosomatid, and they are called Bunia virus-like. These are single-stranded RNA that you can find in Leptomonas. There are Nana virus in the plant pathogen, Nana virus-like in the insect parasite Leptomonas aemori, and so on. Okay, start to have a lot of these viruses. And there is a study which just came out in PNS by the Czech group. Where you can see, and this study, I mean, this table is not complete, it's not updated yet. But you can see in trypanosomatid here, different uh, species like Critidia, Leptomonas, Leishmania, Phytomonas, trypanosoma, and that you can start to see different types of viruses in the different uh, species. So probably. Uh, uh, we will. We can add it. Like Donovanid is positive. We can show it. We can add. Uh, we can probably now change it because there is some parasite in Trypanosoma cruzi, and so on. So uh, I think we are. I think it's great because you can see now, really diversity, and I think that's going to be very interesting in the next year to follow these different viruses, from new viruses like uh, this one. Os this is with Ostrava virus, which uh, that you can find here, and so on. So there is a search for this kind of virus, and because and this everything comes because you have high throughput sequencing. So you sequence the RNA, and then you have the RNA of the Leishmania, and then you find RNA that people were just think were thinking this is garbage. They just put it away. So now if you go back in the, some of the transcriptomic studies of Leishmania, you can find sometimes transcripts which are not related to Leishmania, and you can start to relate them to viruses. So I think it's depending what you do with your transcriptome, 
uh, maybe you should keep it for you for some time, okay? <laughs> because people are looking for that. Now they go in the big database and look for this kind of <coughs> transcript. Anyway, I think uh, uh, the highlights of the talks, if I can call it highlights, I don't know. Uh, we have to be aware that they are viral endosymbionts, they colonize several potters and parasites. And uh, this co-infection between co-infection with the parasite and endosymbiont determine, determine the outcome of the, uh, the pathology. And I think everything, uh, what is very important is when, le the level, and when the type 1 interferon uh, is produced. So what I'm saying is uh, probably that uh, co-infection represents a real-world context. I think we should not forget that we are exposed to viruses all day long. Influenza, small viruses, Toscana virus, for example. If you go in Italy, you can be bitten by sand flies and you can be infected by Toscana virus. You will, not, you, you will have some headaches. You will not see it unless you are immunocompromised, but then come back home, take some pills, some, take some dafalgan, it will disappear. But you are exposed to that. And I think um, probably, um, well that's probably people will not like that, uh, I could explain the difficulty to obtain vaccine in the field. I mean, depending where you are, how you are exposed, you have to check your groups and when you in, inject your vaccine. And uh, it's the same for efficient drugs. And I think uh, the vaccine, oh no, sorry, the viruses can affect uh, the response to the drug. But we have to be extremely cautious in the way we interpret this, uh, this last thing, okay? But it's to be a <coughs> bit provocative. So this is the, the person who did the work, is VJ. VJ is here uh, with the help of uh, Florence. Uh, and uh, Matteo also, who did the work on LCMB. This work was done in collaboration uh, with uh, Dietmarts and Daniel, Daniel Uche Schneider, and a strong collaboration with Steve Beverly. As you can see on the beach, he has the biggest board of everybody else. This is Steve. <laughs> so, uh, thank you for your attention. I think I'm on time. Uh, for question, if uh, any question, thanks.